Hi, this is Rick McCarthy. I lead the library design team at Studio GC Architects and Interior Designers. We are honored to have been selected to work with the Aurora Public Library District on their master plan. This plan will help guide the district over the next 10 years to help them provide you, the residents of the Aurora Public Library District, with the best possible library service. Listening to you is an important part of this process. We hope that you'll watch this short presentation and afterwards vote on some of the things that you want to see in your library. Libraries have changed tremendously in the last 30 years. The traditional aspect of libraries, the books and materials on long rows of shelving, will still be there. But at the same time, if we are to remain relevant to how people access and use information, libraries need to evolve. For many years, I was a trustee at the Gail Borden Public Library in Elgin. Our library became known, among other things, for many of the great events that it held. One I will always remember and that made a big impact on me was the space event. One Saturday, the staff arranged for a couple of astronauts to come to Elgin and talk to the kids, which was a great thing already. It was a super, a super time and everybody enjoyed it and learned a lot, but it didn't stop there. They arranged for when it came over the horizon, a radio link with the space station and the children in Elgin got to talk to the astronauts in orbit in real time. This picture shows a young man in Elgin speaking to astronauts on the space station. And it occurred to me that this is the kind of thing that can change somebody's life. And I realized at the same time that this kind of event sets a new bar for what libraries can be and all the different ways that we can change people's lives. So the space event used cutting edge technology and was very future oriented. But let's go back to the past for just a moment. You remember I was from Elgin and at my library at home, I have a number of old Elgin city directories. And if you're not familiar with those, they're a little like phone books, but they gave a lot more information about things than just somebody's phone number and maybe address. The thing that struck me about the Elgin City Directories, and the one I'm looking at here is from 1915, is that the first 10 pages or so are all the organizations that existed in Elgin in 1915. And Elgin isn't any different than Aurora. They're much the same kind of community, actually. And Aurora would have had the same selection of organizations that people met at. And the thing is about them, they, these organizations have one thing in common, really is that almost all of them are gone. There used to be an entire layer of society where, where people would get together, see their neighbors, talk about things, and that whole layer is just not there anymore. In those days, people would sit on front porches on hot days, there was no air conditioning then, and they would see their neighbors, talk with family, talk with neighbors, meet friends and such, but then something changed television came in and people moved inside their houses and all of a sudden that neighbor neighborly interaction wasn't there anymore in the same way and now many of our children and grandchildren are upstairs by themselves in their bedrooms surfing the internet and looking at that and the way things have changed one of the things that we believe is that in a lot of ways, the library can function as the front porch of the community and help fill in for all those opportunities for personal interaction that we used to have. We'll start the master planning process by looking at the community that the library district serves. The library district has three service points that serve a very diverse community. Downtown Santori Library is the main branch, and it is supported by a west branch and on the east side by the Iola branch. Looking at the income distribution across the district is one way that shows us just how diverse the community really is. We see there are pockets of people in the top 1% of wage earners going down to people who really need help in other parts of the district. 
the question that we need to ask is how do we effectively serve a district that is so diverse? Let's look at a few of the traditional measures that shows where the Aurora Public Library District sits in comparison to some of its peer libraries. These are peer library assessments. Each one of the little blue dots represents one of the libraries that is a peer somewhat equal to the Aurora Public Library District. The purple line you see is the average of the peers and the red dots show where the district lies. On the first chart there on the upper left, you see the library size per capita. All the way on the right, you see the red dot that indicates where the library district sits on this chart. And it's a little bit below average when we look at the entire district, but not too far off. On that upper left chart, we've also broken out each branch individually to see how big it is compared to the number of people that would tend to use that branch. If you look at that, you can see that the main branch, the Santori, is well above average in the square footage per person it serves. On the other hand, both the east and the west branches are somewhat smaller than you would expect for a library to be to serve that population. If we look at the upper right chart, the number of percentage of library card holders in the district, it's above average, that's great. On the lower right, the total holdings per capita, and that's really asking how many things does the library have for each person in the community and how does it compare to the other libraries? And you can see that Aurora is above average there again. So what these all tell us is the library is starting out on a firm footing. It's in a good place now and a good place to be able to start planning for the future. So let's step back for a moment and take a look at the big picture and ask ourselves what really is a library? And we would make the case that a library really is a place that enables learning and entertainment, and it does that by sharing. And what does it share? It shares materials, things like books, things, you'll see what we're talking about there in a moment, experiences, and just as importantly, we believe, sharing each other's company. We think a 21st century library is really a mixture of four different qualities. Here, symbolized by the book, is all the traditional things that many of you grew up with, the com concept of sharing books and materials. At the top, creative activities. That's a newer thing for libraries, and it's really about people coming to the library to create content, not just consume content. Technology, access to technology and access to instruction and how to use that technology. And at the bottom, social interaction. So as we're looking at the entire district here and the various service points, what we're not going to do is take a cookie cutter approach and just say that every, every branch here wants to be the same thing. We think that there's probably a balance point here on this diagram that shows where the best place is for each of the library branches. You know, some of the branches might be more towards the traditional services, some might be more towards creative, some more towards social interaction. And we, what we really want to do is fine tune each one of these library branches to the community and the people it is most likely to serve. Libraries have changed dramatically since I started designing them about 30 years ago. The menu of things that we can look at now and the services that we can provide is dramatically increased from what they used to be. If we look at some of the traditional aspects, like the cozy reading area and periodicals and books and movies and music and local history, those are all still going to be in your library. But we're starting to add new services, things like one example would be the Library of Things. And we see those coming up in libraries now. It's, if you remember, we're talking about libraries are about sharing, all right, but it doesn't have to be books. In the Library of Things, I've seen some of my library clients sharing things like specialized cake molds, uh, popcorn poppers for big parties, fishing poles, telescopes, um, equipment to transfer film to DVD, karaoke machines. And really the point is, 
since it's about sharing, you know, you shouldn't have to go buy a telescope first to see if your child likes one, if you can go to the library and check one out. Just general life and experience, uh, making libraries more accessible. That's a, a real goal these days to make sure everybody has equal access to the library. And in that picture at the upper left, the thing about that picture you might not notice right away is that the lower shelves are tipped out at an angle. And that's so people can see the titles of the books without having to bend over. The older you get, the more sense that makes. If you need good ergonomics, a good workplace that maybe is just different than what you've got at home, the library is the place to do it. Attention to people with special needs, informal seating, natural light and such, and just to get out of the house sometimes, especially in the last couple of years. A lot of people have been somewhat trapped in their houses and they need that other place to go sometimes, and that's what the library is. You see the picture of the juggler there that's talking about pop-up events and what pop-up events are are things that maybe aren't advertised that you come to the library and that you're just surprised by. Maybe you come there one day and there's a juggler. Uh, the next week, maybe somebody's playing a cello or something like that, but we can allow pop-up events to happen because we can make the libraries now more flexible with furniture that moves around and such. On the lower left, you see low contact services, and that's something since uh, the pandemic, we've started to look at a lot more a lot more rigorously. How can we provide library service with the minimum contact with other people? And I know that's against completely the social aspects of libraries that we've been talking about, but in times of a health crisis, this is the kind of thing we need to be thinking. Access to technology, whether it's office services for people who are working from home, um, services for small business, small group meeting rooms with really good video facilities, virtual reality, continuing it and such, and really serving people who work from home. And that's kind of a new thing since the pandemic. And one of the questions we're asking ourselves, Mel, are all the changes that we've seen due to COVID-19 going to be permanent? Are people going to continue working from home? And if so, the library is going to need to look at better ways to serve them. Those creative activities we talked about, whether it's a, a maker space for a, with a sound mixer or a maker space with video equipment in it. But the maker spaces and, and such don't all have to be high tech. They can be for the arts and crafts too. It can be oil painting or knitting too. We wanna to make sure that everybody has a chance to come and do the creative activity that best suits them. And then the lower right is something that's actually, that's really pretty fun. And the culinary arts, we just did the new library in Geneva, and that has a demonstration kitchen in it. And it's really fun, and that's fine all by itself. But in addition to just being fun, it can also serve some real public health aspects. Like if you need to have a class for how to cook for somebody with gluten intolerance or, or you know, other conditions like that, those kind of things can happen at the library. And that social connection, whether it's small group rooms or book clubs or social services, markets and such, just places that people can get together and be with other people. So a couple of examples and a couple of thoughts here. Um, just a, a few things. Uh, up in the upper left is a uh, collaborative gaming studio that we put in a recent library that we did. And this one's aimed pr pr primarily at teens where they can come in and meet with other teams and do things like uh, collaborative video gaming or classwork for that matter. On the right is a craft table. When I was on the board at Gail Borden and Elgin, the teen staff came and they one day to us and said, we want to put a craft table in the teen library. And I thought, no, nobody's going to use that. I was completely wrong. It became immensely popular overnight. And it's something we're looking at, you know, in a lot of our teen libraries now. 3D printing. A great example of a 21st century skill that we can learn at libraries and provide to provide to the library districts. The maker spaces that are just made for doing anything. This is a great simple one here. It just shows some tables. It shows a whiteboard, and it just people can come in there and do what they want to do and tell the library this. These are the kind of materials we need. Let us come and make something. Creative spaces. Spaces with like laser cutters in them. People, we see people coming in and making models and such on these. And I talked about, you know, the importance of flexibility. 
things like demountable walls that can open up and let one space open completely to another one. Or um, if you look at the lower right there, mobile shelving, uh, putting an increasing amount of shelving, not all the shelving, but certain selected shelving units on wheels so they can change. And doing something like that, that's what allows things like pop-up events with the juggler to happen because you can have a space where you push the shelving out of the way, have an event like that happen, and then afterwards the shelving goes back where it was. And it's really nice because we're making multiple use out of every square foot in the library. It doesn't have to be just collections or just events. Here's an example from, um, this is from the South Elgin branch of the Gale Borden Public Library. And there you see a meeting room in the foreground. And behind that is part of the children's library, but separating them is one of those demountable walls that lets that space open. So if there's a big event happening, they can open this wall, push the shelving out of the way and have events that would be like twice as big as that room would ordinarily allow. Again, very flexible and very cost effective because we're not building a meeting room that's twice the size and it, that may rarely be used for that, that much uh, square footage. We're looking at a lot more uh, collaborative work going on in libraries, especially with teens, and that's how the 21st century workplace often operates now. And so there's a really great selection now of furniture that's out there that it enables people to do collaborative work. One of my favorite things is when we look at the children's libraries and different features in the children's libraries, and we're always looking at something that's going to make the children want to come back to the library. If we can get them in the doors, we can serve them. This is a computer rendering for a children's area that we're doing right now in Antioch Public Library. And really what it is, it's a children's feature wall that has little um, niches there that, that, that are padded. Kids can go in those with their friends and their books or their parents even. Kids love little places. This is the kind of feature that they are going to remember and that they're going to want to come back to. Years back, I did a children's activity room in LaGrange, and this was the entry to the room. And what you can't tell by looking at that picture is that door right in front of you is only about four and a half feet tall. And what it does is it makes a statement to any child that comes in that space, whether they can read or not, that that room beyond that is a room for them. There's a full-size adult door around the corner, so not everybody needs to bend over. But again, it's something that the children remember. More recently, we did at the Green Hills Public Library a specific feature, a really fun one, which is an aquarium that the children can go underneath and there's a bubble that they can put their head up in and experience the aquarium as if they are inside it. The children and their parents really love it and it's a great example of one of those things that brings people back to the library. So let's look a little bit at the branches. The West Branch, as you know, is attached to a school. And frankly, at this stage, we don't really know what we're going to do at the branch yet. You know, we'll be looking at how tall the shelving is, what the sight lines are and such. We've already established earlier on that the branch might need to be a little bit bigger ultimately than it is now. We don't really know that yet. But some of the things that I could see potentially happening there, it'll be in the mix, see by the star there, maybe additional small group meeting rooms. Small group rooms are the, actually the single most requested thing that, that we hear from our library clients. They get used all the time. Here's an example of one we did up in Lake Villa Library, or several, actually several of them in a row there. After we did that library, a couple of months afterwards, I emailed them and I asked them, how often do these rooms actually get used? And I think the library opened in August, and they wrote me back, okay? And by October, the small group meeting rooms were being booked 800 times a month. And that just shows how valuable a resource those are to the community. One of the things we might want to look at for the West Branch, potentially, is a better area for teens. Right now, if you look at the, where the red star is there, you can see there's an area that's been set aside for teens that's already there, but it really is just uh, some square footage on the floor, doesn't, and a few pieces of furniture. We're looking at a teen area that's just about that size, actually, for a project up in Antioch Library, and there you see it here. And I think what this shows us is that within the square footage that's already being used for teens on the West Branch, we might be able to do something that would give them a good place of their own uh, on the West Branch and actually, you know, be a closed space so they could make some noise and being teens and such. 
So that'll be something else that we'll be evaluating as we look at this. The numbers did indicate that the West Branch might want to get larger. Again, we don't know that for sure yet, but um, one of the things we will be evaluating is, is it possible, just so we know, to expand the branch or not? Um, again, uh, we'll tackle that when we get into the design process, but it'll be something else that will be on the table for us. If we look at the East Branch, uh, a number of things we want to evaluate there. It's a little confusing right now for those of you who haven't been there a lot. Um, when you pull in, like what what part of the building is for the Parks District and what part of the building is for the library. There's some hallways that are kind of ambiguous there where you're kind of halfway in each one of them. And I think looking at that might be one of the things we want to clean up a little bit just to make it uh, more obvious which one you're in and let the I library or Park District work maybe in alternate hours more easily. Now, if you've been up to the second floor on the Eola branch, you'll notice that uh, a lot of it's not there. Uh, a lot of it's open space. And again, looking at those numbers we opened with before that indicate that the live, each one of the branches might want to be a little bit bigger. The least expensive way to expand the square footage available to the Eola Road branch would be to fill in some of those openings. Now, you know that it has got a large monumental stair there. Um, and, you know, it's nice in certain ways, but on the other hand, it does take up a lot of floor space. So, again, it's not designed yet, but there might be a possibility of, you know, maybe that stairway goes away and becomes more floor space. And maybe we put a second more, uh, a smaller stairway uh, somewhere else there. As you can see, there's one example of where it could be with the orange rectangle there. So that's a, that's a possibility. The other thing we uh, noticed during some teen sessions that we had, we talked about the teen area in the Yola branch and the teens were pretty much universally in favor of something that had a little bit more color and a little bit more fun, a little livelier space. I would support that. I think that that could be improved. That'll be one of the things we look at. The small group rooms we were talking about before are just as important for teens as they are for the rest of the library users. And one of the things we showed them that they really responded well to were um, these little cubes here that this one is an example that can seat four people. They're less expensive than a building addition. They're easy to plug in. They don't require any direct mechanical systems or anything like that. So that is a, a possibility there. Now, when we've been giving this presentation live to people over the last month or two, we've been closing with a time for questions and discussion. Now, you will see as part of this website that you're on here that there is a place for you to click on to pull up a questionnaire. And we have a number of questions that we would like you to discuss and rate for us on a one to 10 and tell us which things you would like to see in the libraries, which ones you don't like to see. So one is don't want to see if you score it five you're kind of neutral on it if you give it a 10 it means that they're something that you really want what we're going to do is take the data from this and here's an example from another library we did where and find out what people think are important and this is one of the aspects which the you know the east branch might be different than the west branch since we've asked people independently what they think there and this will be part of how we fine tune those two branches to serve you the best and we'll do a separate one there we have done a separate one for teens i appreciate you listening to this and following along and it is really an exciting process here and it's exciting for us to be part of this to you know help the library continue that evolution from you know the more traditional library services to all the things that libraries can provide now and hopefully after seeing some of these examples and such you'll see what some of these are about and be better informed and more able to show us what you think is important and working with you we hope to bring this into better focus with the end result being a library district that gives you the best possible library service Thank you again. I'm Rick McCarthy with Studio GC Architects, and you will see us around town, and we look forward to helping you get the best library we can. Thank you.